Well, greetings everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. This is Perry Stone. We have a wonderful teaching session that we're going to be sharing with you on the subject of end time marriage survival plan or how to survive the attacks on your marriage. And if there's ever been a time that a teaching such as this has been needed, it's right now. We're going to go into the Word of God and share a lot of scripture, a lot of truth, a lot of information, a lot of practical help, and also share some personal things with you that I think will be in addition to your understanding and to your knowledge concerning this subject. Now, we are uh, so excited about what God is doing in the lives of so many people around the nation that we know, so many people around the country that we have met, couples, their families, their homes are growing, God is prospering them. But at the same time, in the midst of all that, there seems to be very strange attacks of Satan which are taking place. We encounter people all the time who confide in us and say, Perry or Pam, we are going through mental temptation, we are going through stress, we are going through difficulty that we never dreamed that we as Christian people would ever encounter or would ever have to go through. Now let me say this from the very beginning, that I don't think there's what we could call a perfect marriage. I think that there are people who do their best to make it a perfect marriage, but any time that you have human beings who live in a fleshly body involved, it's not going to be perfect. It's almost like people trying to find the perfect church. Uh, when someone you know, goes and finds the perfect church, it won't be perfect anymore because they're going there. Anytime you have flesh and blood in a congregation, you're going to have opinions, you're going to have emotions, you're going to have decisions made that people don't like, and so you're going to have difficulty from time to time. So the first thing we need to understand, a basic principle about marriage is it's a choice. You have chosen to live with this person, you've chosen for them to be your partner in life, to share your hopes, your, vi your, your visions, your dreams, to share your discouragements together. And you choose to do that. You choose to do that in the good times. You choose to do that in the bad times. You choose to do that in the times when you're mad at each other and feel like you could hang each other from, by, with a rope. And you choose to do that when it's just wonderful and bliss. You know, uh, speaking about marriages being perfect, uh, there's one couple, and I really want to say this very sincerely. I'm not just saying this because I know them or they are related to me. But there's one couple I know that I honestly, if they have... Uh, about as perfect a, a, a marriage as I have ever seen. And that's my grandma and granddad, Bava. Uh, I've said this for years. I've never seen them fuss. I've never seen them get into a major argument. I've never seen them fall out with one another. I've never heard them talk bad about somebody else. They're very happy. They're very content. They uh, uh, talk things out. Uh, they submit one to another. And it's just a wonderful relationship. And uh, I told my wife one day, I said, you know, if I could ever be like anyone and uh, pattern our life, if we, if the Lord tarries and we get up there in years, I would like to do it after my grandma and granddad. And I got to watching them one day, and I thought, you know, what's the secret of this? And I, and I noticed one thing is they submit one to another. And number two is they don't seem to let a lot of stress things get them down, maybe that other people would. Uh, they try to keep excessive stress off of them. And one thing that I've noticed over the years is they are very, very happy people. And that makes a difference. You know, when you're a happy individual, when you're happy personally, you will be more content with the person that you're with if you are personally happy. I think a lot of times marriages have difficulty because the, the wife has an inferiority complex, uh, the husband has a temper, and they're not really happy with themselves. Personally, individually, they have a low self-esteem, as some people would call it. And it, it definitely affects the relationship in the home and in the marriage. So, um, you know, if the Lord tarries years to come, I, I hope and pray that God would allow my wife and I to have that kind of marriage to where we can just flow together and, and be happy. Just, you know, just be happy. Don't worry, be happy, as <laughs> the old song said. But let's go into the scripture teaching together because there's a lot that we want to share with you. The first thing we want to share with you is how we believe that the enemy is, is affecting both the men and the women um, in homes and marriages today. Now, I'm going to talk about three spirits that appear to be affecting the women. Now, when I talk about spirits, I'm talking about the same pattern that we find in someone in the Bible, that same spirit, that same attitude, that same type that we find in the Scripture. First of all, it's what I call the spirit of Jezebel. There is a spirit of Jezebel that is affecting women and I'm talking about even Christian women in the body of Christ, and it's, it's affecting their marriage. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Kings 16, 31, that Jezebel was the wife of a king called King Ahab. Her father was a priest of Baal in the city of Jezreel. Now, Baal, of course, was considered a false prophet, and he was considered an idol. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of verses here that's very interesting. It says that she stirred up her husband, First uh, Kings chapter 22 and verse 25. She constantly kept a stir going in the palace, in the home, 
and in the family. And the problem that Jezebel was having is Jezebel had a very strong controlling spirit. Uh, some call it a spirit of witchcraft. Now, a controlling spirit is the spirit of Jezebel. So when we talk about Jezebel and, and the spirit of Jezebel being on a female, that's what we're talking about. It's a controlling spirit. Now, Jezebel was the kind of person that wanted to have her way. She wanted the best of everything. She wanted the best palace. She wanted the best clothes. She wanted the best home. She had to have the best. She had to be the top. Anyone or anything that threatened her, she had to get rid of it and get it out of the way. An example with that is when... Uh, Elijah went on top of Mount Carmel and killed 850 of the false prophets of Baal, who were her personal prophets, if you please. Uh, Jezebel got into a rage and said, I'll cut your head off. Well, most women by that time would have feared the prophet. Most queens would have said, this is a man of God. We better respect him. We're going to end up the same way. No, she's got to have a conflict with him. You know, tell him I'm going to cut his head off by evening. You wait till I get a hold of him. See, that's that arrogant, controlling spirit that was in her. On another occasion, there was a man by the name of Naboth who had a vineyard near their palace, and Ahab wanted the land, and Naboth couldn't sell it because it was his inheritance. It must have been a jubilee year when the land reverted back to the original owner, so it was his, it was his, his inheritance, and it couldn't be sold on a jubilee year. So Jezebel said, let me handle it. So again, she took control. She began to manipulate with some of her men, she had Naboth set up and then she had Naboth killed and somehow was able to take the property from Naboth and put it in her husband's name and it became a part of the, uh, the palace, a part of Ahab and Jezebel's personal property. Of course, that was the thing that brought the judgment of God down upon her. But a spirit of Jezebel is a controlling spirit. It's a spirit that wants to dominate, that wants to take control that wants to manipulate to get its way and there is a spirit of Jezebel that can come upon women and I'm even talking about women in the church and women in the body of Christ and it creates havoc in the family because it is not the will of God for a woman to have a Jezebel spirit it's the will of God for the man to be the priest of the family and to head up the family and he and his wife to work together in a spirit of love and unity the second spirit and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these but I just want to show you the spiritual application of each one is what I call the spirit of Delilah. Now, the spirit of Delilah, Delilah is very interesting because uh, Delilah was the person who brought Samson down. You know, Delilah did more damage to one man than a thousand Philistines and a roaring lion. That's something to think about. Now, Delilah was the master of seduction. She was the master of deception. And she constantly pressed in to the spirit of Samson, tell me your secret. If you really, really love me, if you really, really want me, you're going to tell me what your secret is. And of course, she pressed him. Uh, in, in Judges chapter 16 and verse 9, she let him sleep in her bed. In Judges chapter uh, 16, verse 12, he stayed with her again. In Judges 16, 14, uh, Samson uh, has been sleeping in her lap, and finally she just could start vexing him. She said, you don't love me. If you really loved me, then you would tell me the secret. If you really cared about me, then you would tell me the secret. You're mocking me. Tell me. And this is what the Bible said in Judges 16, 16. His soul was vexed unto death. Now, with Jezebel, she's constantly kept her husband stirred up, but here, Delilah keeps her husband vexed. Now, this vexation here actually means a mental oppression. He was mentally oppressed by her words. Well, you know, when you're mentally oppressed by someone, they weren't even married. He was uh, out running around and, and, and staying with this woman. He'd go back home to his family. He'd go sneak off down to the land of the Philistines and come back home and sneak off. Well, if he's vexed unto death, then he needs to leave her. But the problem is... He had created a soul tie with her. You know, pe women that have a spirit of, of seduction on them, uh, when they begin to seduce a man, they create a actual soul tie in that man's life, and therefore it's difficult for that man just to break away because his flesh is pulled toward that person. So there is a spirit of Delilah. And of course, again, Delilah brought down a great man of God, and she did it through her seduction, and she did it through her words. She did it through vexing him. And spirit of Delilah is a spirit of seduction. It is a spirit that is, believe it or not again, affecting many, many women in the church and in the body of Christ. You know, you always, um, when, when you hear of a minister, for example, uh, and I know three or four cases who uh, maybe have fallen into sin with the opposite sex with another woman, you always hear people say, how could that man do that? I can't believe that man. And I've heard conversations like this for years, and I very seldom hear people say, what about that woman? Can you believe there would be a woman in a church position, sitting in a church that would, you know, nobody ever talks about the woman. But it takes two to tango, as the old expression says. You know, it, it took the man, yes, but the woman had to submit as well. So, you know, you, you don't blame it all just on the man. You have to blame it on the female as well 
for falling into it. They both fell into it together is what I'm trying to say, so you can't just blame one. But there are people who are seduced. You know, Paul talked about in the latter time, some shall depart to faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there are seducers on the loose. We need to be aware of that. The third spirit is the spirit of Saul's, Saul's daughter or the wife of David, the spirit of Michael, Saul's daughter. In First Samuel, you'll read where David and uh, she, the, the marriage was actually prearranged by King Saul. You know, King Saul said, the man that destroys Goliath, I'm going to allow him to marry my daughter. And he did that. He gave David his oldest daughter, and then she ran off with somebody else and got married. And that didn't work. So he got the second daughter, which was Michael. And she was, again, the daughter of King Saul. Now, being the daughter of King Saul had some very interesting uh, applications to it. Now, first of all, she's, she appears to be, uh, she's very young. She's infatuated by David because David has just killed a giant. Here he is, probably a young teenager, and he's the national hero. You know, all the girls want to date David. He's like the star of the football team or the uh, the uh, school high school president. I mean, he is the man. You know, all the young virgins and all the young girls of Israel are talking about David. Boy, wouldn't it be nice to marry David? And, of course, a teenage girl or a young girl can get very infatuated with the boy that is cute and the boy that's in position and the boy that everybody's talking about. So there was no doubt a little bit of that in this marriage relationship from the very beginning. But if we read the Bible, we do find out that they really did fall in love with one another. And this happens a lot of times with couples that get married very, very young. Sometimes they, they really do it out of love and other times they do it out of some form of infatuation. But at the same time, if they work together on their marriage, they can uh, actually cause a love bond to be formed. And this is what happened apparently in the book of Samuel with uh, David and with Saul's daughter, Michael. Now, the problem was that the father-in-law of David, and this is, again, Michael's wife, King Saul, had no respect for David. He had no respect for the Ark of the Covenant. He lost the Ark of the Covenant, and Philistines took it, and, and you know the Ark was back and forth. So he had, no, he had no respect, really, for the presence of God. You don't even hear the Ark mentioned much under King Saul's reign. And, of course, David later brought the Ark back. But you see, when you're living in a household where your father-in-law hates your husband and he tries to kill him 21 times, it really can have an impact on you emotionally and mentally. And so when she, when David later on in the book of 2 Samuel brought the Ark of the Covenant back and he went up to the palace to bless his family, the Bible said that she, his wife, was looking down on him. And the spirit of Michael is a spirit that always looks down on other people. It looks down on the way they're worshiping. It looks down on the way that they're, that they're trying to obey God. Always looking down on somebody. That's the spirit of Michael. And she has a critical spirit. And, of course, she began to criticize David for his dancing before the Lord. She said that he had showed himself. He had these. He had a linen ephod on, and that was, of course, a priest's garment. And it wasn't his royal garment. It wasn't his royal crown. He put that light garment on where he could worship and dance before the Lord and become like a representative of the priest, bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. And she criticized him for how he looked. And then she criticized him for how he danced. And then she criticized him, and she said, you wanted to show off in front of all those young girls down there. You know, no doubt when David was dancing, the young virgins, the young girls, and they would have an epiphano going. In other words, they would line up on one side, and another group would line up on the other side, and and this is how they would sing, you know, in First Samuel, they would say, Saul has slain his thousands. And the other side would sing, but David has slain his ten thousands. And they would get this going back and forth. Well, no doubt they were, there was music and singing that day. And, she, you know, as she's looking down from the window, she sees her husband dancing and some of the young virgins are laughing and giggling just like young girls will do. And she became very raised and very jealous of that. And so she accused his worship of being false. Well, that's one thing you don't accuse David of doing. You don't accuse his worship of being uh, not real or being false or being fleshly because you're going to stir, stir a war up with him. Well, he more or less said to her, woman, if you think I acted vile today, and that's the word he used in the Bible, if you think I acted vile today, you haven't seen anything yet. In other words, if you think I dance now, wait till I, wait till I start worshiping God in the tabernacle. If you think I praised God now with instruments, you wait. And something happened, and there was a snap in their relationship. There was a rift or a bridge that was created in their relationship because of this. And it says in the Bible, Second Samuel, that uh, she bare David no children. She went barren. Now, there's a real lesson here, and that is this, that she looked down on David and became critical of him. The spirit of Michael is a spirit that looks down on everyone. It is a negative spirit and it is a critical spirit. Now, once again, Jezebel tries to control things. Delilah vexes you and seduces you. But Michael, Saul's daughter, criticizes you. Now, these are the three spirits affecting the women. And, of course, it says that she bare David no children. Now, the Bible is very clear about this, about her bearing David no children. And, and the point that I'd like to make here is she went barren. 
Those who have some, a critical spirit, those who complain, those who criticize, will go barren. And that represents not bearing fruit. And the tree, of course, that does not bear fruit, Jesus said, that branch is cut off and cast into the fire because it's useless. So uh, Saul's daughter started out well, started out in love, but became jealous, the spirit of her father, which is a spirit of jealousy, and that's what affected King Saul. If you read the book of First Samuel, it says the spirit of God departed from him, an evil spirit from the Lord began to trouble him, and he eyed David and was jealous about David. So that same spirit of jealousy, it manifested, though, in a different form. Saul was jealous because David was popular and was going to be the next king. Michael, Saul's daughter, was jealous because David uh, danced before the Lord and she didn't think he should, and he got the attention of some of the women that were there. And uh, this is what Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9 says. It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. Now, we know that Solomon said that. Uh, he may have got that statement from his father, David. It's better to dwell in a corner of a housetop. Now, the problem with that is when you have a brawling woman in the house who's always complaining or nagging. Now, some of you women are saying, hey, you, you know, you're getting down on the women. No, I'm going to talk about the men in just a moment. We're talking about spirits that affect women. Now, if this doesn't affect you, then you shouldn't be upset about it. But if I've hit you, then you need to keep your feet right where they are and let me dance on them a little bit and try to help you out if that's all right. So he said it's better to go up on top of the roof than to dwell with a brawling woman, a complaining, a nagging, criticizing woman in a wide house. Well, that's what David did. David ended up having what I call a rooftop ministry. Uh, there was a breakdown in his relationship with his wife, 2 Samuel 6, 23. It says she bare him no children. That was up to the day that, that she died. Now, the relationship was destroyed, and he was dwelling with a brawling woman. So what did he do? He goes up in the book, of, I think I think it's 2 Samuel chapter 11, and he has a rooftop ministry. <laughs> He's up there rising a great while. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, rising at the, uh, when the sun is, is setting. He's been sleeping all day. And he gets up there and sees Bathsheba on the roof. Now, let me just stop here and say something about this because uh, people have not understood why is Bathsheba on top of the roof. What is she doing bathing herself? Well, I did a little study about this, and I think you'll find this very interesting, that in the Old Testament, when a woman went through her monthly cycle, there was a period of time that went by, and then she would ceremonially cleanse herself. And when she ceremonially cleansed herself, she would do it prior to the time that she could become pregnant. So her husband is out of town. Her husband is Uriah. He is out of town. Most all of the men are fighting. If you'll read the Bible, they are fighting a battle. Uh, 2 Samuel 11 one says there was a time when kings went to battle, but David arose from his bed at eventide. See, kings were supposed to be going to battle. David was supposed to be battling. You see, if you're out at the war when you're supposed to war, you see there's a time of war and a time of peace. But if you're involved in the spiritual battle when you're supposed to be involved in the battle, when you're fighting, when kings are fighting, you're not going to have time to be up on the roof. But he had time to, to get up on the roof. So what Bathsheba is doing is she is ceremonially cleansing herself. There are no men in the area, or they're not supposed to be. Um, all the men are at war. Her husband's out of town. And so she's bathing herself. Well, you know, David had been bothered by the spirit of criticism. He wasn't going to have any children through his wife. He knew that he was going to die one day. He's getting up there in years. So I believe he actually let the enemy rationalize in his mind, I need a, I need a son, I need a child. This is a beautiful woman. And he found out that she was married, but he went into her anyway, committed adultery. She bare a child. And uh, in order to cover his steps, of course, you know the rest of the story, how he killed the husband. And two wrongs never make a right. And as a result of murdering the husband, as a result of his sin, uh, he uh, lost, David, King David lost four of his own sons in his lifetime. And, of course, when Nathan the prophet came to David and began to give the parable, some of you have read that, about there was a poor man that had one lamb and a rich man that had many lambs, and the rich man went and took the poor man's lamb. What shall happen to this man? And David yelled out to Nathan and said, He shall restore to this poor man four times. And Nathan pointed to David and said, Thou art the man. You took Uriah's wife. You have many wives. You have everything you want in the kingdom. But you took a, a poor man's wife, Uriah, one of your own men, and took her, and you were the man. And so he said, the sword of the Lord shall not depart from your house. And, of course, David had four of his own sons to die. And if you've ever lost a family member that's that close, like a son or daughter, then you must, you must know what David went through emotionally and mentally uh, during this time. So we see that in David's life that uh, I believe that part of the pressure that came in his life 
was part of the problem with the relationship with his wife. You know, it says that David arose to eventide. I wonder where his wife was. Where was his wife at the time he brought Bathsheba into the palace? I mean, there was a great rift that came in their relationship, and it literally broke their relationship. Instead of healing, it broke it. And as a result of it, this uh, spirit of adultery came in. And, of course, David had to suffer as a result of it. So once again, uh, just briefly looking over, there's three spirits that that we see uh, coming upon the many many women. Now, not all, for goodness sake, not all. Not every woman has, some women have none of these bothering them, thank God for that. Is the spirit of Jezebel, which is a spirit desiring to control everything, including her husband. Spirit of Delilah, which is a spirit to, uh, attempting to seduce. There are women I know a, a case. I do not know this person. Thank God. Don't care to know her. But there is a person in the neighboring state that a minister told me about who literally has gone from place to place, from church to church, church seducing men of God. She seduced the youth pastor in one church. She went to a big church and seduced the pastor there. She went to another place and seduced another man and just goes from church to church. Now, uh, what she does is she comes in to places where they don't know her. And, uh, of course, the Bible talks about if someone is doing that to, to warn people. So wherever she's at, someone needs to be warned about this. But this was in a, a state in the Midwest, and a pastor was telling me that it was it's a terrible thing. But the woman, that's what she does. She has a spirit of seduction on her. You know, she gets in counseling and starts talking about her problems and her marriage problems and starts weeping and crying, and goes through all the scene, and that's usually how it happens. So there are people that are bound by a seducing spirit. And then, of course, Saul's daughter, once again, is a spirit of criticism. Now, I know you're waiting for me to say something about the men, if you're a lady listening to me right now, and that's what we're going to do. I want to show you the three spirits that are affecting men uh, in the body of Christ. I'm going to do that right now. They are the spirit of Uriah, the spirit of Solomon, and the spirit of Eli. And let's break these down for you so you can hear what we're talking about here. Let's begin here with the uh, spirit of Uriah. Now, once again, what we're doing is we're looking at characters in the Bible and showing their strength, well, actually their weakness, I guess you could say, and how that same type of weakness comes over into people today. Uh, when we talk about the spirit of Jezebel, we're not talking about some weird reincarnation of Jezebel floating in the earth or Delilah's spirit floating in the earth. I think you understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the characteristic of that person's spirit, the spirit that was affecting them. And I want to kind of clarify that before we begin again. All right, who was Uriah? Uriah was the husband of Bathsheba, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 3. Now, if you read the scripture, you'll find out that this was not the only place in the Bible where Uriah's name is mentioned. 1 Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 41 tells us that Uriah was one of David's mighty men. Now, David had about 600 mighty men. He had 33 that were mightier than the 600. Then he had three out of the 30 that were greater than, than the others, the other, the other in that particular group were. And Uriah is listed as one of the 33 top mighty men of David, which means that David knew him very well, that David uh, and he had lived in the cave together, that he had fought for David together. I mean, this was like a close friend. It wasn't like he didn't know who Uriah was. You know, when when David sent and asked, who's why, who's who's who is that bathing on the roof? And the man came back and said, it's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. I mean, he knew who that was. He knew who Uriah was. Uriah was a friend of his. Uriah had fought for David. Uriah had protected David. So this was a, a very bizarre situation again here if we look at the situation in the life of David. So he was one of David's top 33 mighty men. Now, let me show you something. I'm going to show you this from a totally different perspective. Now, uh, we were talking about this one time, and I had a friend of mine that, that uh, disagreed with me. He said, well, Uriah was dedicated to David and dedicated to the army, and that's why he did not go home when David told him to go home. I said, but you're missing my point here. The point is this. Let me just let me just ask you who are men who may be listening to me right now. If you were fighting in, a, in the Gulf War, if you were fighting a war in Panama, and all of a sudden you got a call from the leader, you know, you, you've been gone for a couple months, and you got a call and says, I want... Uh, so and so, and talking about you, to come home for about for about a week, and you come home to you, your commanding officer here at the states or whatever, and he says, you know, you've been really fighting hard. I'd like for you to spend about two days with your family. Well, I don't know of a man that I know of that wouldn't just absolutely go for the opportunity of seeing his 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 wife, especially after being gone on the battlefield for three months. Now, you know, we could act real. Uh, well, you know, sir, the other soldiers are fighting, and it's not right for me to be able to do that. And I'm sure that's very commendable, and it's commendable in Uriah's life. But the point I'm making, let me just show you this. And, of course, we know 
And we can get into the theological aspects of this. We know it wasn't God's will for Uriah to go and be with his wife because it would cover David's sin. So we can get into the theological applications of this. We can get into... But what I want to do is show you a, another perspective of the life of Uriah and make a point with it. So what happened is when Bathsheba became pregnant with David's wife, he called Uriah from the battlefield and called him to his palace. And this is what he said. He said, I want you to go home, spend the night with your wife. Well... When David woke up in the morning, Uriah was sleeping at the door of his palace. Now, you got to remember, David arose from his palace at Eventide, and he could look over on the roof and see Bathsheba bathing herself. So Uriah's house was really not that far from the king's palace. I mean, it wasn't like he had to go five, hour, five hours down the road to be with her, or even 30 minutes down the road, because Mount Zion, all those houses were all together in that area. So the next day, he did. David did something which was not right. Uh, he got Uriah drunk and then asked him to go home, and he wouldn't do it. Uriah, according to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14, slept with the servants uh, there again and would not go home. Now, the point I make with this, and I hope you'll understand how I'm saying it, because I know that when I say what I'm about to say, there will be some that will disagree with me, but Uriah is the type of man who is so caught up, let me, let me put it this way, he's so dedicated to his job, so dedicated to the king and so dedicated to the uh, soldiers and the army of Israel that he does not have time to give his wife attention. Now, let me just stop and just preach right there for just a moment. There are men that are workaholics, and that is that they spend morning to night working on their project, their business, and their job and have very little quality time for their companion. You know, if there's one thing Pam has taught me, and, and that is that just because I'm in her presence, just because I'm in the same room, just because we are in the same vehicle does not uh, mean that we are spending quality time with one another. Now, to a man, you know, just, just him being in your presence means you all are spending time together. But to a woman, that's not so from a woman's perspective. So one thing she's taught me is just being there physically does not mean I'm there emotionally or I'm just there mentally. I can I can be in her presence and have my mind on a church service or have my mind on an altar service or have my mind on a message or have my mind on something I need to do. And there is a difference. So Uriah to me, the spirit of Uriah to me represents the man who is so dedicated and caught up in his work, which, thank God, that's commendable to be dedicated, but he doesn't have time for his wife. He had an opportunity of spending two nights with his wife, whom he had not seen in a long time. And he didn't desire to. He had no desire. Now, that's the point I want to make. He had no desire to spend time with his wife and give her attention. So, put it together, and here's what you've got. David's having a rooftop ministry. And I'm saying that facetiously, of course, kind of as a joke. He's up there hanging out on the roof. His wife is not around. They've had marriage trouble. Bathsheba's got a husband who's too busy for her. He's out fighting all these wars and battles, caught up with work. Now, if you want to know what that means in the term of people who counsel marriages, it means there's an affair in the in the wings just getting ready to happen. Because you've got a man who's got problems in his marriage. You've got a woman who, it appears, has a husband who's very caught up with his work and, sh and doesn't have time for her. I mean, how do you think it ma how do you think it made Bathsheba feel when Uriah was home and he wouldn't even come by the house to see her? Now, again, I'm looking at this perhaps from a different perspective, but my point is that a lot of marriages fall apart because the husband does not show the wife the attention that she needs. One of the top priorities in the life of a woman is attention. Uh, every counselor knows that. Every marriage counselor knows that. Um, you know, uh, I've had to read books and study to find out some things and have to go through the experience of it. But a woman craves the attention of the male, the attention of her husband, the details. How do I look? Oh, that's fine. You know, she doesn't want to hear that's fine. She wants to, you to tell her how she looks. You know, when she puts the perfume on, how great she's, I mean, everything. They, they have to have the attention of their husband. So Uriah represents the husband who does not have time to show his wife attention that she needs. And, of course, again, when you have that, you're going to have a major, major problem in your marriage. All right, the second spirit, this is a different one. Now, here we're going to go from one extreme to the other. The second spirit affecting men is called, I call it the spirit of Solomon. First Kings chapter 11, 4. This is the the hunk of the day. This is the man who's macho. This is the man who thinks he's God's gift to the women. And that's the spirit of Solomon. And I want to show that to you. First Kings chapter 11, verse 4. Uh, strange women turn Solomon's heart around. Strange women. We're going to talk about that. Um, 
in detail uh, as we continue this teaching. Uh, Solomon was a young man that when he first you know, became king, he was very humble, very meek, very much in love with God. He prayed for wisdom, and God began to give him success. And because of his wisdom, you got to understand, here's a guy that's good looking. Here's a guy that's got wisdom and got money. Well, those are the three things that would attract the average woman. Looks, money, mega money, and wisdom. Boy, he's smart. He's smart, good looking, got money. So, you know, he is, there he is. All these women, Queen of Sheba, everybody else is wanting to come up and see this guy. So he is surrounding himself with females. 